So we've talked a bit about hash functions and, and we can use cryptographic hash functions for authentication. Let's, in this, this topic, we're still talking about authentication. In fact, we're going to step back and recap or recover what we've talked about for general authentication and then go through another way to authenticate. Instead of using hash functions, we can use what's called message authentication codes. We'll see they're very similar and we won't spend too much time on them. But first, let's talk generally about authentication and what we require and the general ways in which authentication works and look at the all the techniques we have available. In fact, go back to our services or a, a little bit of a variation of the, the services and in particular the different types of attacks that we have available. Disclosure, message disclosure is this attack where if I send a message someone intercepts and they can read the contents and they've disclosed the contents of that message. That's our normal form of attack that we think about. When someone says encryption or security they usually first think about of trying to find the message that someone has sent, disclosing the contents of that message. What mechanism do we use to prevent the disclosure of messages? We encrypt the messages. So if I want a message to send to someone and I don't want anyone else to read that message, I encrypt the message, the plain text, send the ciphertext, and then the receiver can read the message, but someone who intercepts the ciphertext should not be able to find the plain text. That's our normal uh, or most common example of where we use encryption. And that's, we've covered that since the start of the course, all the different ciphers we have available. Traffic analysis is another form of attack. Uh, we haven't talked much about it. We've said what the attack is, but we haven't talked about how to prevent it and how to, the details of how uh, it can occur, but we can use encryption in some cases to hide them, uh, who is communicating and make it more difficult to analyse traffic and other techniques as well to prevent traffic analysis, like introducing random traffic makes it harder for someone to analyse the traffic. But what about some of the other attacks? Well remember we have a masquerade attack where someone pretends to be someone else. How do we prevent that? What mechanism do we use? Well, authentication is the mechanism to prevent someone pretending to be someone else. In fact, we don't prevent it, we detect it if it does happen. If someone pretends to be me and they send you a message, if we're using authentication techniques, you should be able to detect that it didn't come from me, it came from someone else. So someone can perform a masquerade attack but they should be easy to detect if we use authentication techniques. Here we see we say the technique is message authentication. In fact authentication we can authenticate the contents of the message or the source of the message. So sometimes we distinguish, sometimes we just call it authentication or message authentication. Authenticating the source is who did it come from. Authenticating the contents is making sure that the message received is the same as the message that was sent. Okay? But they're both referred to as authentication. So a masquerade attack, we use authentication to stop it or to at least detect it. Same with modification attacks. We can, someone can try to modify the content along the way or not just modify the message, maybe I send 10 messages. They can try and rearrange the ordering of those messages, modify the sequence. Maybe that can be useful for the attacker. Or even the timing of the messages. I send a message if the attacker can delay it or uh, somehow um, make it such that it causes an inconvenience or a problem for the receiver because of the different timing of receiving the messages, that can be a form of an attack. All of these require modifying what has been sent or the order in which it's been sent or how it's been sent 
And the way to stop such attacks is again to use authentication. How to detect the modification of content? Then include some authentication mechanism such that when someone sends a message, if it's been modified along the way, the receiver will detect that. For example, a signature. We sign a message. If an attacker tries to modify the message, assuming our hash function has the desired properties, the receiver will be able to detect something's gone wrong. So we can stop modification attacks, or at least detect modification attacks, using authentication techniques. Hash functions, are, hash functions combined with encryption are one form of authentication, but there are others. What about source or a destination denying that a message was sent? Well, also use authentication techniques, but a, a specific instance of, or a specific case of authentication, a digital signature. A digital signature is it's related to authentication, but it's, it's this special case of having something that we can prove it came from just one person. And a digital signature is using, importantly, using public key cryptography. Here's a case. A user takes a message and we say they sign that message. And the important part is that they encrypt either the hash of the message or even the message itself using the user's, the sender's private key. And we can confirm that signature because it should only successfully decrypt with that user's public key. If it successfully decrypts with the user's public key, it means it must have been encrypted with that user's private key, which means it must have came from that user. Because only one user in the world has the private key of A, and is that user A. So, Public key cryptography, specifically encrypting something, either the message or the hash of the message, with the sender's private key is providing a digital signature. And that can stop someone denying that they sent a message. Because user A signs a message and sends it, and then sometimes later, user A says, I did not send it. Well, B has a copy of it, including the signature of the message, confirming that it did come from A. Okay? So there's a way to confirm at later dates, later time, that the message was sent. And similar with destination repudiation. that If the destination de denies it, you can make use of digital signatures to check whether they have received it or not. So that's about some of the attacks that are possible, what mechanisms do we use to prevent or detect them? Encryption, authentication, and as a subset, digital signatures. We're focusing on authentication. Well, what do we have available to do authentication? How do we perform authentication? There are two main things. Usually what we do is we have some function that we apply on a message called, or that produces some output. We saw in the previous topic, we take a hash of the message and we get a hash value as the output. So that function is the hash function, the output is the hash value. The output generally is called an authenticator. Okay, it's just the general terminology. And combined with some function, like a hash function, or we'll see others, we also need some protocol, this mechanism for what do we send and what does the receiver do. That's, although, that's like these diagrams. This is the protocol. The function is what we apply on the message. For example, the operation we do here. The protocol is what do we send and what does the receiver do. So they are the two parts of authentication. And there are different ways to do it. There are different protocols and there are different functions available. Focusing on the functions, well in general there are three types of functions we can use. We can use a hash function, and that's what we saw in the previous topic. 
The previous topic was about using hash functions to perform authentication. For example, for a signature, we take a hash of a message and then encrypt with a private key. And we saw four or five of those diagrams, different variations of using hash functions. But we don't have to use a hash function for authentication. There are other ways. One is simply encryption. By encrypting a message, often we also provide authentication using symmetric or just public key encryption. So we don't need to use a hash function. And there's a third approach, another type of function called a MAC, a message authentication code. It's in fact similar to both of a hash function and message encryption. So what we're going to do now is talk generally about, well, how do we provide authentication using encryption? We know some examples of how to provide authentication using a hash function. How do we do it using just encryption? Just AES or RSA? And then we'll finish, how do we do it using a MAC? Introduce what a MAC is. How do we authenticate a message when we're encrypting a message? That is, I have a message I want to send to you. I encrypt it using DES. I send you the ciphertext. When you receive it, it's provided confidentiality, but in many cases, you can also authenticate and make sure it came from the right person and make sure it hasn't been modified along the way. So here's using symmetric key encryption for authentication. We take a message, we encrypt using some symmetric key algorithm, DES, AES, triple DES, whatever you choose. We have a shared secret key K. We send the ciphertext across the network. The recipient takes the ciphertext, decrypts with the same shared secret key K and gets the message back. We know this provides confidentiality. Only B, and A as well, only they can recover the plain text. If someone intercepts the ciphertext, assuming we have a strong key and a strong algorithm, that person who intercepts cannot find the plain text. So that's confidentiality. But we also provide other services. We also provide authentication of the service, of, of the source, that is, the receiver knows who this message came from. B, the receiver knows that the message came from A. How do they know? Well, recall that the key, K, should be known only by the source and destination, A and B. So if B receives a message, some ciphertext, if it successfully decrypts with that key, K, then it must have been encrypted with that key K and therefore it must have came from user A or B, but B just received it so B did not send it to itself. So B knows if they receive a message and it successfully decrypts with this key K, B knows that this message came from A. So that's authentication of the source. They know it didn't come from someone else pretending to be A. Because if someone else pretended to be A and sent B a message, they have to encrypt that message with some key. But they don't know the key K because that should be a secret key. So just encrypting a message also implies or also provides authentication of the source. And similar, what if someone tried to modify the message? Can a third user, C, intercept the message and modify it, what do they need to do? Well, they, they would need the key. Because if we intercept the ciphertext and modify the ciphertext, then it will not successfully decrypt. Or at least we will not get the original plain text when we decrypt. And if the ciphertext is something different from what was sent, when we try to decrypt with the key, we'll get some random looking output. Because it's a different ciphertext, we'll get a random looking plain text, and the receiver should be able to detect that. 
the only way a third user could modify the, the plain text is if they know the key. But they don't know the key because that's a, a secret. So what we normally assume is if, if the receiver successfully decrypts the ciphertext they receive, then that confirms that that message must have came from the person who also has that key and there's only one other person in the world that has this key K. So that provides source authentication. And it also means that the message has not been modified along the way. So it also provides data authentication or data integrity, is the, the service that we call it. So symmetric key encryption on its own provides these three services. Now, in these two authentication cases, we've made some assumption. And that's the assumption that if we successfully decrypt, well, that we can detect that it was a successful decryption. And the way we detect is that when we decrypt, that we can recognize that we've got the correct plaintext. If I have some ciphertext, and I decrypt with the wrong key. Let's try. Let's say our third party, our attacker C, encrypted some modified message. Run out of space. Let's say the attacker C is trying to pretend to be A. So C has intercepted the message, they've modified the message, and they encrypt it with some other key, K prime. Then they send it to B. B receives, they think the message came from A. So they decrypt using key K. But this message, M prime, was encrypted using K prime. When we try to decrypt with a different key, we'll get some plain text as output. What we assume is that if we decrypt with the wrong key, that the receiver, the decryptor, will be able to detect that this plain text is not the correct plain text. And that's normally the case if the plain text has some meaning. If the plain text was some English phrase or an English document, if we decrypt with the wrong key, the resulting plain text will be random characters. It's highly likely. And therefore, the decryptor we detect, ah, this is not a message that has meaning. Something went wrong. Let's see a simpler example of that. Here. You are you are user B. Okay? User A has sent you something. So you, user B, you've received some ciphertext. You think it came from A. Okay? And with A, you have a shared secret key K. Here's the ciphertext. DPN. Da, da, da. So you receive this ciphertext. You think it came from A. Therefore, you decrypt using the key that you shared with user A. And you decrypt with the key K and you get this plain text. So the output you get here is this plain text. Do you think that this plain text was encrypted with the key K? Yes or no? Do you think that the plain text that you got as the receiver was encrypted with the key K that was shared with user A? Hands up for yes. More? More hands? Please put your hand up. When you decrypt the ciphertext and you get some message that makes sense, normally we assume if it makes sense that it must have been the right key. Okay. Well, no. What? Well, I think we know and we've seen when we looked even at classical ciphers, if we decrypt with the wrong key, we usually get random looking output. 
coming back to the Caesar cipher, we had a brute force attack on a Caesar cipher. We had, we had cipher text, we tried all 26 keys. One of them produced an English phrase, 25 others produced random looking strings. So if we decrypt with the correct key, we should get a message that we recognize. If we decrypt with the wrong key, we will get random looking messages which don't make sense. That's the assumption we're making. So in this case, you receive ciphertext, decrypt with a key, and this key K you shared with user A. You get a message that makes sense, therefore you assume key K is the correct key, that is the message was encrypted with key K, and therefore the message came from user A because the only other person who has key K is user A. So this provides authentication. You assure the message came from user A. And also, do you think that the ciphertext received has been modified along the way? User A sent some ciphertext. You received this DPNF, da 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 da. Do you think it's been modified? How do you know? Well, you. Well, you, you should be quite confident that it has not been modified. You receive this. You don't know what they sent. You know what you received. How do you know it hasn't been modified? Again, because it successfully decrypts to something that makes sense. If it was modified, instead of D at the start, it was X, P, da, 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 one letter was modified, then the output here would be different. We would get some strange letter here. We'd get a phrase eventually that didn't make sense. So if the ciphertext was modified along the way, most likely the plain text when we decrypt will not make sense. Since the plain text makes sense, we assume the ciphertext was not modified, and we assume it was encrypted using key K, and we assume that there's only a one other user in the world that has key K, and that is user A. So we've provided authentication of the source and authentication of the data. So this is this assumption. If we get plain text that we recognize, authentication works. Another example. Here's the cipher text you receive. You decrypt. What do you think happened? What do you think happened here? You've decrypted the cipher text, QEF, and you get some plain text, F T U E. -t Again? Option one is not sent from A because we've got a plain text that doesn't make sense in this case. Okay? It doesn't make sense to me at least. So assuming we know what to expect, say the language, then here's a plain text after decrypting it doesn't make sense. Well, why wouldn't it make sense? If A has sent me a message that has no meaning, well no one does that. So why doesn't it make sense? Two possible options. Either it came from someone using a different key than key K. It was encrypted using K prime, for example. And then I decrypted it using key K because I thought it came from A. So maybe that's the case. Someone is pretending to be A and they used a different key to encrypt the message. So when I decrypt with key K, I get some strange looking plain text. Or Maybe someone has modified the plain text along the, uh, the cipher text along the way. A has used key K, sent some cipher text, but user C modified that cipher text to be this QEF. Da, da, da. And therefore, when I decrypt using key K, I get unrecognizable plain text. So in this case, I would assume something's gone wrong. No, not really denial of service. We don't, know what, we don't know what has happened, but we know something has gone wrong. 
because we obtained a plain text that does not make sense. We cannot recognise it. Either someone else sent it using the wrong key, or using a different key than K, or someone modified the ciphertext along the way, and therefore it did not decrypt correctly. So again, we provide authentication. In this case, because we get the wrong or an unrecognisable plain text, we detect that either it didn't come from A or someone modified it. And we'd need to do something about it. We wouldn't trust this message I just received. So this assumption is if we can recognise the plain text, we assume the correct key was used and nothing was modified. If we don't recognise the plain text, we assume something has gone wrong. Either the wrong key or the ciphertext was modified. What about this case? What happened? Is the plain text correct? All right. In the previous examples I was sending English phrases, here is, it's a part of an image, a JPEG image. Can you recognise the plain text? Not so easy. Okay? It just looks like a random sequence of zeros and ones. But maybe it's a compressed image or a portion of a, 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 a Word document or an image that's being compressed with gzip or with uh, RAR or something and we just get the binary data. Now we have this problem of the receiver, we got ciphertext, we decrypt with key K, we need to be able to check does this plain text make sense? Because we're making this assumption. If the plain text makes sense, everything was okay. If it doesn't make sense, something's gone wrong. That was in the previous two cases. In this case, how do we know whether this plain text makes sense or not? Well, it's not easy to know. I don't know whether it's part of a, an image or if it has no meaning, it's just random. So here we identify a problem with this idea of we need to be able to recognise the plain text to provide authentication. So we need to be able to recognise the correct plain text. In example one we did. Assuming the message was in English, the plain text had some expected structure. It had words that we recognise. So we assumed it was OK. And therefore we assumed it was sent by A and it had not been modified. In example two, we assumed the message was supposed to be in English but we saw that the plain text had no structure. It was just random letters. And therefore we assumed it was either not sent by A or it was modified. In example three, what do we assume? Did it come from A or not? Well, it's hard to tell because what is the expected structure? I don't know in this case. Okay. So authentication works when we're using encryption only if the message has some expected structure, some structure that we can recognise. Like in the first two, the message was English which has some structure and therefore if we get a plain text with that structure, good. If it's unrecognisable, then we assume something went wrong. But in some cases, the message may not have structure. What do we do? So if we encrypt a message and we send it, if we cannot detect the structure in the received plain text, what do we do? How can we... Again, packets, uh, but what does that help for? Because the packet has the application layer itself in the uh, You're on the right track, but try to be a bit more specific. What can we do such that when we decrypt, 
decrypt the ciphertext and get plain text, we can recognize the structure. Let's say the original plain text doesn't have any structure I can recognize. It's some compressed file. Looks like random zeros and ones. At the receiver, when I decrypt the ciphertext, I want to be able to detect whether or not is it, it is an expected message. What can we do? Add, we can add some structure to it. Okay. So authentication works when we're using encryption if the receiver can recognize the structure in the plain text. If it's an English message, that's easy. If it's a compressed file or a binary data, then it's much harder. If it's in that case, therefore, all right, I think we're getting to add some structure to the message before you send it. So the plain text messages, have if they have structure, we can detect whether they're correct or not. But sometimes that can be difficult, depending upon what the plain text is. If it's difficult, then add some structure to the message, the original message, before you send it. So that the receiver, when they decrypt, they will recognize that structure and they can confirm has it been modified or not. Okay? And there are different ways to add structure to a message. Let's say I have a binary file I want to send to you. Before I send it, add some extra information like a error detecting code, a frame check sequence, a CRC checksum. That adds some extra structure so that when the receiver decrypts the ciphertext, they can use that error detecting code to confirm whether the plain text is correct or not. And in network communications, even the packet header has some structure and that can be used to detect if the packet received is correct or not. In practice, most messages either already have structure that we can detect or it's quite easy to add some structure such that we can detect if it's a correct plain text or not. So in most cases we can. In other words, in most cases when we use encryption, we also provide authentication. Some examples of those last two. We can add an error detecting code or a packet header. Here's an example of adding an error detecting code. We have our message. Instead of encrypting the message and sending it, we first add some extra information about that message. Uh, error detecting code, it's shown here as some function on that message. And attach that and send them both encrypted. In fact, this is about this, is similar to doing a hash of a message. Same concept. And not much use here. If we send data inside a TCP segment, that header has some structure. So when we decrypt at the receiver, we expect the plain text to have the structure which matches the TCP uh, header. For example, port numbers, sequence numbers, and so on. So in most messages that we send, there is some structure included such that the receiver can detect that it's the correct plain text or not. So in summary, Whenever we encrypt our message and send it across the, met, across the network with symmetric key encryption, we normally provide confidentiality, authentication of the source, and data integrity, or authentication of the data. So all services are provided. What about when we use public key encryption? Well, and we've covered this before, if we encrypt with the public key, we provide confidentiality. We do not provide any authentication. Because we encrypt with a public key, the public key of the destination, that is PUB. B can decrypt it because only B has the private key, so it's confidential. No one else can decrypt the ciphertext because no one else has the private key of B. But anyone could have sent this message. When B receives it, how do they know that it came from A. They don't in this case. Everyone can obtain the public key of B 
Therefore, anyone can encrypt a message with the public key of B. So, in this case, there's no authentication provided. In this case, we have data authentication. Uh, sorry, let's go back. What, what authentication do we have here? We don't have authentication of the source. What do we have? We do have authentication of the, the data, the contents. So same as with symmetric key cryptography. Still, if the message was modified, it would not successfully decrypt. So we don't have authentication of the source, but we do have authentication of the data. If it's modified, we will detect it. But if someone else sends it, we will not detect. If we want to detect, uh, if we want to provide authentication of the source, we can use the keys in the opposite direction, our private key. And we get our digital, sig digital signature, a proof that it came from A. OK, so we can use, crypto uh, we can use encryption symmetric key or public key to provide also authentication, confidentiality and authentication. And with public key we can combine, encrypt with the private key of the source, then encrypt with the public key of the destination, send it, decrypt and then verify. So we can combine the, the ordering of the keys. Provides all services. So, yep. This one? No, there's no confidentiality here because it's encrypted with a private key of A. Everyone has the public key of A. So anyone can decrypt that message. So there's no confidentiality in this case. Someone can intercept the message and decrypt any as long as they have the public key of A and by assumption, uh, by, we assume that that's always public. So if we want both authentication and confidentiality with public key encryption, we need to apply two operations. With symmetric key encryption, we can just do it once, just encrypt once. So it has some difference in terms of performance. So, we're looking at the different ways in which we can authenticate data and the source. The previous topic we spoke about hash functions, that's one way. We just briefly went through another way using just encryption. And then there's a third way, using message authentication codes. And we'll go through them quite quickly because there's not much different from what we've seen in other uh, hash functions and encryption. <coughs> What's a message authentication code? A MAC. Different from a MAC in terms of medium access control and uh, network protocols. A message authentication code is really we have a, a MAC function, some function, that takes two things as an input. It takes a message and a secret key, a shared secret key K. And it returns a message authentication code. It's a bit confusing the names here. We often write MAC as the function, takes as an input the message and the key, and returns usually a, a short code as an output, sometimes called a tag. Similar to a hash function. Remember what a hash function does. Takes a message, any size, returns a, usually a short fixed length hash code. A MAC takes a message and a key and returns usually a short fixed length tag or MAC or message authentication code. And in fact, the similarities mean that 
a MAC function is sometimes called a keyed hash function. It's a hash function, but it also has a key. We use, we use hash functions and MAC functions for similar purposes, for authentication. So recall hash function, take a message as an input, produce a hash code as an output. MAC function, similar, takes a message as an input but also a secret key and produces a, a tag or a message authentication code as an output. And we use them for authentication of data in, in similar ways. It's just that the functions are different and importantly, a Mac also takes a shared secret key. A hash doesn't. In fact, another way, another thing that's similar to is encryption. Symmetric key encryption. We usually write encrypt using some shared secret key, some message, and we get some ciphertext. Coming back to just symmetric key encryption, we take some plain text, a message, a shared secret key, apply some function, and we get ciphertext as output. MAC is similar. It takes a message, a shared secret key, apply some function, and get a tag as output. Except Generally, MAC functions are easier to design and implement than encryption functions. A MAC function doesn't need to be reversible. Remember, with encryption, when we get the ciphertext, we need to be able to use the same key and decrypt and get the original plaintext M. That's not true with a MAC function. With a MAC function, given the tag and the key, we don't need to be able to find the original message again. So therefore, in practice, it's usually easier to, to design these MAC functions than encryption functions, and faster for them to, to work in software and hardware. So a performance advantage. So there's some similarities between them. And we use them in similar ways for as hash functions and in our encryption to provide authentication. So just some examples. Focus on the top one. I want to send a message and I want the receiver to be able to authenticate to make sure that the message wasn't modified and that it came from me, not someone pretending to be me. So I take the message. I apply my MAC function. On this diagram it's denoted as C. Okay. That's the MAC function, shared secret key, and I send that the output combined with the message across the network. So the message and the MAC value is attached to that, and the receiver authenticates, they check. They take the receive message, apply the same MAC function, C in this case, using the same shared secret key, and compare it against the received MAC value. If they're the same, it assumes that the message has not been modified and that the message came from the person who has the secret key K. And there should be only one other person in the world that has that secret key. And you can easily follow through and see, well, what, what can an attacker do? If they modify the message, if the attacker modifies the message, then they should not match because if we modify the message, the output of the MAC function should be different than the received MAC value. 
or if they use the wrong key. Similar to what we saw with encryption, if you use the wrong key, the output will be different and we'll be able to detect that. The other two diagrams are similar, but they are also combining encryption, just different ways to use MAC functions. So it get more complex, but we will not go through them. There are other ways as well. So let's finish by looking again briefly at well, how strong is a MAC function? How do we measure the security? Similar to hash functions. It's like providing collisions or, or uh, calculating collisions. What an attacker wants to do, they don't know the key. They want to find a valid MAC code for some given message. Coming back to this example, if if this message was sent and the attacker can find a different message with the same MAC code as the one that was sent, then the receiver will be fooled into thinking that the message uh, has been received by A. That is, if we modify the message to M prime, The original message was sent, M concatenate with the MAC of K and M, intercepted, attacker modifies the message and sends the same MAC value. They just change this part, then this will work that is, it will defeat the, the security of this system if the MAC using this key of message M is the same as the MAC using the key of M prime. So if the MAC of two different messages with the same key is the same, then the attacker, same with it when we analyze the hash function, the attacker can fool the receiver into thinking that the message came from A, but it's in fact be modified by the attacker in this case. So the same concepts apply for what an attacker can try to do with a hash function. If they can modify the message and get the same MAC value, then they can break the security of this system. So the challenge for the attacker then is to be able to compute the MAC code without knowing the key to find, so here's the, the definition of our requirement for security. If we have some message X and the MAC using some key of that message, it should be hard for the attacker to find some other message X, it's different from XI, with the same and, and the MAC value of that message X. Okay, so it should be hard for the attacker to find that. So that's a required property of the MAC function. And similar analysis can be performed as done with hash functions. It's a similar problem. We're not going to analyze. Uh, we'll just tell you the results. So there are two ways to break a MAC function. Try all possible keys. How much effort? Depends on the key length. If the key is k bits long, a brute force attack, try all possible keys, takes two to the k attempts. The other way is to try an attack to find the MAC value and it turns out that depends upon the length of the MAC value. So if we have an n bit MAC value, the output here, t, is n bits long, then the amount of effort to break in a brute force attack is two to the power of n. So if my MAC function here, t, is 128 bits and the K, the key is 256 bits. How much effort to break this MAC function? Two 
2 to the power of 128. Because there are two different approaches. You either do a brute force on the key or you do a brute force on the MAC value. So you do the one which will get you to the answer fastest. This would take 2 to the power of 128 operations or attempts. This would take 2 to the power of 256 attempts. So the security of the MAC function is proportional to the minimum of the two. In this case, 2 to the 128. If the key was only 64 bits in length for this MAC function, then the security would be equivalent to 2 to the power of 64 attempts. Okay. So you need a key which is long enough and you need a MAC value which is long enough. And then a brute force attack is not possible. There are many different MAC algorithms. We're not going to go through any. We don't see uh, many of them in the examples that we see of our network protocols, except for one, which we'll see on the last slide. Generally, they're considered secure. The MAC al algorithm's available. So it's really make sure your key is long enough and make sure the MAC code is long enough and people cannot break them. Some MAC algorithms are based upon using different modes of operation with block ciphers. For example, DAA, Data Authentication Algorithm, used DES. And then a new one, CMAC, used triple DES or AES in different modes of operation. And there are others. We will not go through how they work, but they combine block ciphers in different ways. DAA, CMAC. Maybe the one that you will see and we may see it in some examples, is HMAC. This is a MAC function that uses the existing hash functions. Remember, hash function takes a message only. MAC function takes a key in a message. Other than that, we use them for the similar purposes. So HMAC is a general approach that takes an existing hash function, introduces also a key. So it turns a hash function into a MAC function. The benefit here is that there are well-known hash functions which have good software libraries and even hardware implementations. So MD5 and SHA. The idea is, let's just use them again, but also introduce a key. So HMAC turns hash functions into MAC functions. Just an example of how it does it. It uses the hash function, the key, and some other values, some XORs on some paddings. It uses an OPAD and an IPAD, where they are not tablets, they are just strings, predefined strings. Some padding used in here. So we have a message and some key. If we use HMAC, we take our hash function, for example, SHA1, we take our key XOR with this string here, or this constant value, and concatenate with our message, take the result of that, and concatenate with K XOR with OPAD, and then take the hash of all of that, and we get the output. So the idea really is turn a hash function into a MAC function. And the advantage is that we can use existing software for hash functions. And the security of HMAC depends upon the security of the hash function. Because people have analysed the hash functions a lot, they know how secure they are and they trust them. So that's one you may see in some of the network protocols. Done. Very quick on MAC functions. No more that we need to cover on that. Any questions? Why do we need a MAC function? It's a different way to authenticate. It has an advantage of using the key in this case. If you see when we, when we use a hash function, for authentication, we normally do not just use a hash function, we also use encryption. 
So, for example, I've removed it, but when we did a di digital signature, we had a hash and encryption. For performance reasons, we may not want to do encryption. So, for authentication, just use a MAC function, which can be faster. So, for, per for performance reasons, for practical reasons, if you don't want to use encryption, and you want to perform authentication, then you can use a MAC function. Because often encryption is slower, or you need a license to use a particular cipher. So there are costs involved of using encryption. So it's an alternative to using hash functions and just plain encryption. Any other questions before we finish this topic and start a new topic? We've got a lot of time remaining. I'll stop on this topic here, yes. Let's, let's not start the next topic, but let's give a, an example. It may just take 10 minutes. Uh, it's always Friday afternoon, our lectures. If we stop every Friday afternoon... Let's do a quick example of using OpenSSL because your next homework, it's not using this one, it's using something similar. Uh, this one, the example I'll go through is, and quite quick, it's using RSA, public key encryption, and digital signatures using OpenSSL. So you can read about it on the website. I'll provide a link later, or it's on the web course website already. But we can use OpenSSL to encrypt and to provide signatures. Actually, I need the instructions. Your next homework, and I've, I'll release it today or tomorrow, is very simple. It's even simpler than this. It's using Diffie-Hellman. So, so we can do it quickly. I'll just copy and paste some uh, commands. Uh, maybe. All right. You do not have to remember these. That you can find them on the website. But this is just a command using OpenSSL to generate Gen P key, gen, generate a private key. In fact, it's generating a pair of keys. Gen P key, generate a private key and a public key. Using RSA, a length of 2048 bits, and the public exponent of 3. Remember, E in RSA, let's set it to 3. And let's output it to a file private key dash A. And there, it just generated my public and private key. It saves them in a file. There it is. Now, this is hard to read. What it, OpenSL normally does with it, its keys when it generates them is it saves them in this format which is not encrypted. It looks strange. It's not encrypted. It's just a different encoding. So there's some information about the keys, public and private key, for example, E, D, N, also P and Q, the primes in RSA. We'll see them in a moment. But normally, instead of storing them or displaying them in a text format, it encodes them into what's called base64, which is just a way to encode them using ASCII characters in a format that can be easily sent across the network in an email, posted on a web page, and so on. So this is not encrypted, it's just encoded. And OpenSSL provides a way to decode it very easily. Uh, here's one. We take that as an input and display it in text. I'll go up. 
So what I just did is used a, this P key operation to take my private key, it's in fact a pair, private key and public key for RSA, and display it in text mode which shows the encoded form and then after that it shows in the, the human friendly text form. It shows my modulus, N, remember RSA, we have N, public exponent, E, which is 3 in this case, I set it to be 3, private exponent, which is D, that's my private value, here it is, a long value, and it also stores the primes, prime 1, P, prime 2, Q, they, they are private, don't look at them, they are mine, okay? <laughs> prime 1, prime 2 yeah. is P and Q, and it stores some other values that help in calculating later, but are not necessary, but just improve performance. Uh, so that's my key pair, in fact, my public and private key. Let's, let's extract just the public key from that because I would like to give you my public key. I generate my own private key and then I would like to make my public key available to others. So we can extract just the public key. We take as an input the private key and the output, let's call it pub key dash A, I'm user A in this case, and we say pub out, output the public key. Yes, yeah, so all it does is it takes the public values out of my key pair. My key pair has the private and public values. I store that for myself, but to give to someone else, I just give them the public key. And let's look at that in a text format. Again, it's just in the encoded format originally. So, and in the text format, the public key in, and it shows us just the modulus n and the exponent e equal to 3. Okay, so that, they are my public values. I can give you this file. Okay, I will post this file. Uh, the file was pubkeya.pem. PM is just the format and the way that it's stored. Beforehand I generated pubkey B, but I would post pubkey A on a website or I'd include it at the bottom of my email. That would be my public key. Okay, so I can make it available to anyone. And what's next? I've also done it for some other user, user B, in this, just for this demo. So assume user B has done the same thing already. They've generated their private key and they've also extracted their public key. So let's assume we've exchanged our public keys. What can we do? Sorry? N is 2048 bits in this case. Okay, so it shows the values in hexadecimal, but N was chosen to be 2048 bits. I've got a message here, just some text file. Uh, we can calculate the hash of that message. SHA1 sum is just a program in Linux on the command line that calculates the, the SHA hash using the SHA1 algorithm. There are different variations. And here's the hash value of the contents of the file. Not the file name, the contents. 0, 06, da da da. OpenSSL has its own way to do that as well. There are other programs that will do it. It's called the digest and you can specify the algorithm and it produces the same value. So it's just another way to calculate the hash of the contents of that message. Now, I've got a message. I want to send it to user B. I'm user A. I want to send it to user B. What do I do? I w well, first I want to provide two services, confidentiality and authentication or a signature. So we're using RSA in this example. I want to, let's first sign the message. So I want to send this message to someone else, to user B. 
I want to first sign the message. How do I sign the message? I use my private key. Okay, that's important. So OpenSSL allows us to sign a message. I specify the hash algorithm, SHA-1, because in fact a signature, we take a hash of the message and then encrypt that hash value with the private key of the source, of the sender. So I use SHA-1 as a hash algorithm and then we've got the option to sign and I specify my private key, which is the one I created before. And the output, let's call it sign something. It's a binary, it produces just a binary value. Uh, so put it into a file and the message we want to sign. So all I did is, well, that operation applies the SHA-1 hash function on the message and we'll get this value 064 all through the CA6 and then it encrypts that value with my private key and the output is saved in this file sign a.bin and last thing let's provide confidentiality by encrypting the message using RSA and there's this operation public key utility to encrypt the input is the message the in key is what I'm going to encrypt encrypt my message using some input key and it's the again you're right the public key of B. For confidentiality, I encrypt the message using the public key of the recipient, B. I'm not going to combine them in this case. I'm, I'm going to do them separate. Public key of B and output my ciphertext. I've done something wrong. What did I do wrong? Uh, I need another option. I need to say that the, it's a public key coming in. Encrypt my message using a public key as input and that public key is the public key of B and output into this file called ciphertext.bin. So this file contains the ciphertext. I now send that to user B, and I also send the one I created before, sign, sign a.bin. I send these two files. This is the ciphertext, this is the signature. Send them to B, and then it's the job of B to decrypt and to verify. So the last, assume now we've sent them across the network and B has received them. B now needs to decrypt. I've already created the key for B. So let's decrypt. Similar operations as encrypt. Take the ciphertext as input. Input key is what? By default, it uses the private key. What uh, B wants to decrypt the ciphertext. What's the input key? The private key of B. A sent the ciphertext to B. It was encrypted with the public key of B, so we decrypt with the private key of B. And let's call it the output received. And let's look at the received file now. OK, so the received file is the same as the original message after decrypting. Has the mo file been modified? Who did it come from? Well, anyone could have sent us this file. 
So now we use the signature to verify the signature. Anyone can encrypt with B's public key and send it to B, but we also receive the signature, so the last thing, last thing is to check the signature. Again, we must know that hash algorithm, SHA-1, and instead of a sign operation, there's a verify operation. And we need to specify a key. Which key do we use to verify? Public key of, of the sender, okay, of A, correct. So now we're verifying, and the input signature is that file that we received. And the file that we're verifying is the received one. So what we're doing is use the public key of A, take the signature that we received and the file we received and check them. And it simply says verified OK. okay so it does everything for us. It decrypts using the public key of A and compares the hash values. And if they're the same, it says verified OK. And now user B knows the received message and that they are certain it came from user A. And it hasn't been modified along the way. Confidentiality, digital signature, and source, uh, both source and data authentication in that case. Enough. That's it. That's an example of using RSA. It's on the website. You can see all those commands. I will re release the homework, which is even simpler, but using Diffie-Hellman. Okay? So that will be the homework due for next Friday. There will be no online quiz, just the, the homework. I will send it out an email soon. Okay, we'll see you next week. <laughs>